Picture this. It's September 1998. You are in a conference room at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The most powerful bankers in America are gathered around a table, and they're terrified. Why? Because four guys with Nobel Prizes just lost $4.6 billion in four months. And if they go down, they're taking the entire global financial system with them. This isn't a movie. This is the story of long-term capital management, the hedge fund that proved you can have two Nobel Prize winners, a former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, and some of the smartest mathematicians on Earth, and still almost destroy civilization. Today, we're exposing how genius became catastrophe, how mathematical certainty met human greed, and why the too-big-to-fail doctrine started with a fund you've been never heard of. Because here's the terrifying part. We're about to do it all over again with a I 1994. John Merriweather walks away from Salomon Brothers after a trading scandal. But he's not worried he's about to assemble the most intimidating team in finance history. First, he recruits Myron Scholes and Robert Merton. These are not just professors. They re-about to win the Nobel Prize in economics for their work on options pricing. The actual Nobel Prize, the model they created, Black Scholes, is used by every trader on Wall Street. Then he adds David Mullins, former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve. The guy who was literally helping run America's central bank is now running a hedge fund. He rounds out the team with PhD mathematicians, computer scientists, and veteran traders from Salomon Brothers. The average IQ in the room is probably 160. Investment banks are desperate to give them money. They re so confident in this team that they accept ridiculous terms. LTCM charges a 2% management fee plus 25% of profits. That's highway robbery in finance, but people pay it anyway. Why? Because these guys have discovered something Wall Street loves more than anything, a way to make money that seems like a con lose. Here is how LTCM claimed they de-make risk-free money. They define tiny price differences in similar assets and exploit them. Example. Italian government bonds and German government bonds. They're both European, both stable countries, so logically they should have similar prices. But sometimes Italian bonds trade slightly cheaper because people worry about Italy more than Germany. LTCN's computers would buy Italian bonds and short German bonds. When the prices converged, which they always did, boom, profit. It's called convergence trading, and mathematically, it's brilliant. The models show that these price differences always disappear. It's not gambling, it's mathematics. Except there's one tiny problem. The models assume normal market conditions. They assume liquidity. They assume rationality. They assume the world makes sense. Here's where it gets insane. These arbitrage opportunities only make small profits, maybe 0.5% per trade. So how do you get rich? Leverage. LTCM borrows massive amounts of money to amplify those small returns. They start with $4.7 billion of investor money. But they don't just invest $4.7 billion. They borrow until they control $129 billion in assets. That's 27 to 1 leverage. But wait, it gets worse. Through derivatives, their total exposure reaches over $1 trillion. That's trillion with a T. They're controlling more money than most countries' GDP. The logic? We're so smart, we've eliminated the risk. So why not borrow more? Their models say the probability of catastrophic loss is 1 in 10 billion, basically impossible in our lifetime. The models are perfect. The math is flawless. The Nobel laureates have checked everything. What could possibly go wrong? For three years, LTCM is a money printer. 1,995, 43% returns. 1,996, 41% returns. 1,997, 17% returns. Still incredible. John Merriweather is now worth over $100 million personally. Scholes and Merton win the Nobel Prize in 1997. The fund is managing $7 billion and the partners are legends. But there's a problem nobody's talking about. They're running out of good trades. When you make 40% returns, other people notice. Competitors start copying your strategies. The arbitrage opportunities get smaller. The easy money is gone. So what does LTCM do? They take bigger risks. They move into markets they don't understand as well. They increase their leverage even more. By early 1998, they're not just trading bonds. They're betting on Danish mortgage bonds, Russian government debt, equity volatility, 
merger arbitrage, literally anything their models say will converge. Their portfolio is so complex that even they can't fully explain all the connections. But the models say it's fine. The math says it's safe. And then Russia says, hold my vodka. Russia is having a financial crisis. The ruble is collapsing. The government is running out of money. LTCM's models say this is fine. Russia is a small part of their portfolio. And besides, when one part of the world has a crisis, money flows to safe assets like use treasury bonds. Their trades are hedged. They'll be fine. August 17, 1998. Russia defaults on its debt. This isn't supposed to happen. Developed countries don't just refuse to pay their debts. It's not in the models. And then something even worse happens. Instead of money flowing rationally into safe assets, everyone panics. Investors don't want clever arbitrage trades. They want cash. They want to get out of everything risky immediately. The spreads that LTCM bet would converge start diverging instead. Wildly, Italian bonds don't get closer to. German bonds, they get further apart. Every single one of LTCM's can't-lose trades starts losing, simultaneously. This is the flaw in their Nobel Prize-winning models. They assumed markets would stay liquid. They assumed you could always sell your position. They assumed correlation patterns from the past would hold. They were catastrophically wrong. Here's where leverage kills you. When your trades lose money, your lenders demand more collateral. But LTCM doesn't have more collateral. It's all borrowed. So they have to sell positions. But when they try to sell, there are no buyers. Everyone knows LTCM is desperate, so prices collapse further. August, down 44%. September, down another 50%. In four months, they've lost $4.6 billion, nearly all the investor money. But here, that's a nightmare. They still control positions worth over $100 billion with derivatives exposure over $1 trillion. And they're about to be forced to liquidate everything at once. The partners are calling everyone they know. Give us money, please. We just need to survive a few more months and the trades will come back. Nobody wants to touch them. September 23, 1998. William McDonough, president of the New York Federal Reserve, gets a briefing that makes his blood run cold. If LTCM collapses and force liquidates, the shock waves will hit. Every major investment bank, they all have exposure. The treasury bond market, LTCM is huge in treasuries, derivatives markets globally, potentially the entire financial system. This fund that almost nobody outside Wall Street has heard of is suddenly a threat to global financial stability. How did this happen? Because LTCM was so smart, banks gave them special treatment. Lower collateral requirements, ability to trade without standard safeguards, credit based on genius rather than actual risk. The banks assume Nobel Prize winners couldn't fail. McDonough makes a decision that will haunt financial regulation for decades. He organizes a bailout. September 25, 1998. McDonough gathers 16 major banks in a room. The message is simple. Either you bail out LTCM together, or you all suffer when it collapses. It's not technically a government bailout. No taxpayer money is involved. But make no mistake, the Fed is orchestrating this. They're using their power to force private banks to rescue a failing hedge fund. The banks contribute $3.6 billion in exchange for 90% of the fund. The original partners who started with billions now own 10%. But here's the real kicker. Shoals, Merton, Merriweather, the geniuses, they still take home tens of millions personally. They nearly destroyed the global economy and they're still rich. LTCM limps along for another year, then quietly dissolves in 2000. No criminal charges no jail time. Just a gentle exit and a stern talking to. The LTCM bailout established a precedent that Wall Street immediately understood. If you we big enough and interconnected enough, the Fed will save you. Not because they like you. Not because you deserve it. But because letting you fail would hurt everyone else. This is the birth of too big to fail. Ten years later, this exact logic would justify bailing out Bear Stearns. AIG, Citibank, and dozens of other firms during the 2008 financial crisis. LTCM had $4.7 billion under management. In 2008, Lehman Brothers had $600 billion. The lesson from LTCM? Don't just be big B so interconnected that your failure threatens everyone. It's a perverse incentive. The riskier and more leveraged you become, the more likely you'll be saved. 
Let me explain the psychology that destroyed LTCM, because it's the same psychology destroying firms today. When you're told you're brilliant your entire life, when you win Nobel Prizes and make millions, you start believing you've transcended normal human limitations. You think the rules don't apply to you. Scholes and Merton Merton built a model that won them a Nobel Prize. So when reality contradicted the model, they didn't question the model. They assumed reality was temporarily wrong and would correct itself. LTCM strategies were so mathematically complex that investors and regulators couldn't fully understand them. This complexity became a shield against scrutiny. When you can't understand what someone's doing, you assume they're smarter than you. Sometimes they're just better at hiding risk. LTCM's models were back-tested against decades of data. The math said their strategy should only fail once every billion years. But all that historical data came from relatively stable market conditions. What happens during unprecedented crises? The models had no idea because they'd never seen one. This is like building a boat that works perfectly in calm water, then being shocked when it sinks during a hurricane. When you're making 40% returns, you don't think, I should take less risk. You think, imagine if I borrowed more. Leverage feels like a genius multiplier when you're winning. It's actually a stupidity multiplier when you're wrong. Want to know the most infuriating part? John Merriweather started a new hedge fund in 1999, called it JWM Partners. What was his strategy? The exact same thing. Convergence trading with massive leverage. It collapsed in 2009 during the financial crisis. He started another one in 2010. That one shut down in 2019. Myron Scholes. Still works in finance, consulting for hedge funds. Robert Merton. Still teaching at MIT. They didn't learn. The system didn't learn. The only thing that changed was the Federal Reserve now knew it would have to bail out the next one too. Now let me terrify you about what's happening right now. High-frequency trading firms use AI algorithms to execute millions of trades per second. These algorithms are far more complex than LTCM's models, making decisions faster than humans can comprehend, heavily leveraged, interconnected across global markets. In May 2010, the flash crash wiped out $1 trillion in market value in minutes because algorithms started selling to each other in a feedback loop. The market recovered, but it proved these systems can go haywire. In 2012, Knight Capital lost $440 million in 45 minutes because of a software glitch. The company went bankrupt. Here's what keeps me up at night. We now have AI algorithms making trillion-dollar decisions based on models even the creators do and fully understand. They're optimized on historical data. They assume normal market conditions. Sound familiar? The difference? LTCM took four months to collapse. AI algorithms can collapse in four seconds, and they're all leveraged. They're all interconnected. They're all too big to fail. We've taken the LTCM disaster and automated it at light speed. LTCM's collapse taught us something fundamental about risk that we keep forgetting. The smartest people in finance built a system so complex that no one understood where the true risks were until it was too late. Their Nobel Prizes became a shield against skepticism. The math was perfect. The assumptions were wrong. They modeled everything, except the possibility that everyone would panic at once. They calculated every scenario except the one where the rules changed. This is the fundamental problem with modern finance. We've built systems that work perfectly until they do end. And when they don't, they fail catastrophically all at once. The 2008 crisis? Same story. Banks used complex models to prove subprime mortgages were safe. Nobel Prize winners again. Risk eliminated through mathematics. Couldn't possibly fail, until it did. Right now, there are hedge funds using quantum computing and machine learning to find arbitrage opportunities LTCM never dreamed of. They're leveraged 50 to 1, 100 to 1. Their strategies are so complex that even regulators can't audit them properly. When the next crisis hits and it will... It won't take four months like LTCM. It might take four hours. The Federal Reserve will face the same choice. Orchestrate a bailout or let the system collapse. You know what they'll choose. They always do. Because that's what LTCM really taught us. If you're smart enough, connected enough, and catastrophic enough, someone will save you. Not because you deserve it. But because letting you fail would hurt everyone else. That's not a financial system. That's a hostage situation. If you made it this far,
Drop a emoji because apparently math can't save us from ourselves. The scary part? This video is about 1998, but I could film the exact same video in 2028 about whatever AI-driven hedge fund destroys the economy next. Subscribe to the Capital Historian Studios channel for more such videos. Because history doesn't repeat, but it sure as hell compounds at 27 to 1 leverage.